Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is now time for Hour 2 of Guy Talk, something that we thoroughly enjoy on Thursdays. It is Guys Who Talk. I've got a professor, a pastor, and a Sunday school teacher. I go in order. I've got Dr. Greg Borgon, Pastor Tom Parrish, and Jeff Verdorn. Gentlemen, welcome to Hour 2. Good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Good, here. Good right. afternoon, Bill. All right. Glad to be with you. Here's a question. Uh, what is Revelation about? Future prophecy or history, current, future? Question mark. Oh, that's a good one. Jeff. Great question. Jeff. So, it, it salivating. Actually, yes. yeah, it actually tells us right in the beginning of the book, it says, this is the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Mm-hmm. So clearly the book is written about future things. Now, there are some in the church who believe all the events of the book of Revelation are yet future. There are some in the church that say the events of the book of Revelation are are past. They're historical. Yet the book starts with, I'm going to show you what must soon take place. So clearly future things. Mm -hmm. So the futurists date the book of Revelation around 95 or 96 A.D., and at, which is after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD. Mm-hmm. If you are a preterist, if you believe the events of Revelation have already come upon the world, and most preterists believe that those events were fulfilled in or around 66 to 70 AD, you therefore have to date the book of Revelation prior to 66 AD. And that's exactly what they do. They date the book about 60. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so that's interesting. So it depends on... Your view of how you handle the book of Revelation, whether it's still yet future or whether it's talking about historical events. So the question is then, did all the events of Revelation happen in and around 66 and 70 AD? I think that's an easy question to answer, but I'm going to add, add one more verse outside of the book of Revelation to this discussion. And that is in Matthew 24, which is talking about this future tribulation period. It says this. It says that then there will be a time of distress that comes upon the world that the world has never seen and will never see again. In other words, this future seven-year tribulation period is going to be so bad the world's never seen anything like it before. It's not restricted to the Israel. It's Correct. the world. 66 to 70 AD was a bad time, especially for Israel. Many, many people were killed and their temple was destroyed. But it's not the worst event in human history. So I take a futurist view of the book of Revelation that I believe all these events that are coming up on the, on the world are yet future. Do you think that most people are confused simply because when it says soon to come, that they're automatically thinking, well, soon meant right after that was declared, and so it must have happened? That's a great point, because a couple times that word is used. Interestingly, the Greek word for soon that's translated in the English as soon is the Greek word tekos. And it can mean soon as in a short period of time, but Jesus has been 2,000 years, right? Right. It can also mean suddenly. Mm. So Jesus is going to come back suddenly, which is exactly how he said he was going to return. He's not expected. As a thief in the night when you do not expect it. Exactly. Yeah. Let, let me jump in sense. and confuse everybody. <laughs> I am not a preterist, but I believe it was written before 70 AD. And the reason I believe it is not to say it doesn't have a future uh, You're talking about the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. Revelation. John never talks about the temple being destroyed. Now, if that was the biggest thing in Jewish life. If the temple was destroyed and he's on Patmos, maybe he didn't know or whatever, but if he knew the temple was destroyed in the Revelation, I'm sure that would have come up in some way. It didn't, which tells me from my perspective, he wrote it before 70 A.D., because he would have seen the temple being destroyed as the fulfillment of Jesus' words in Matthew 24. Yep. Instead, he sees it as something still coming. But again, one of the problems I've run into as a pretty evangelical Lutheran, uh, I get tired of the labeling we put on each other. Preterist, 
premillennial, postmillennial. No, no, I'm trying to understand what did the Bible actually say, and so are you, Jeff, and so are you. I'm not saying we're not. But I hear these labels all the time, and I reject them because I think the Lord can give us different insights as we go through this. And my rationale for 50 years, because I wrote a paper on this when I was in seminary. I was the only one in seminary in 1978 who wrote a paper that said Revelation was written before 70 A.D. Even the professors thought I was crazy. But the logic was, if Jesus prophesied it, why isn't John saying a word about it in Revelation? Now, I do believe it is for the future. I'm not arguing that at all. But I had this— You were just talking about when it was written. Yeah, just when it was written. That's all. Not not what it's talking about. Yeah, and a a futurist— wouldn't and I'm gonna I have to use these labels just sure, to kind of categorize you. people in, in a certain group you. or another. Whatever. <laughs> yes, I, I love you too, Tom. But the the futurist it doesn't really matter. It's the the you understand the preterist yeah. has to have it written before 70 A.D. A futurist wouldn't care if it was written in 60 A.D. or or 95 yeah. A.D. Right? Because the 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 futurist still believes that these events are still yet in the in the future. So yeah. 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 All right, Vince wants to know, we're all wonderfully made, then why do we not condemn all wars? A chaplain in the army should rebuke before battle, not pray for victory. Well, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, Remember, we're not, we we are, we've been made by parents. We are the product of reproduction. Um, There are some that will say that, well, God made this, made me this way, in their excuse to justify their sin because, well, just God made me this way. No, 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 he didn't. Sin is a behavior. It's missing the mark against God, and so God did not make you that way. So let's let's establish that truth right away. God did not make you uh, to sin. Uh, That was not his desire, not his will. Uh, We all have choices in in this world. So secondly, then the question is uh, simply, is all war sin? And and I I don't go there. There are just wars. There are there are just reasons to fight. You know the barbarians are attacking from the north, and they're you know raping and pillaging and stealing and killing all our people. Oh, but war's a sin, so we're going to speak out against the war. No, you're going to defend your village. You're going to fight and kill the evil attackers that are attacking you. So I would argue there is just war. When you think so about I, what happens in at the Garden of Eden and and the sin that that uh, takes place, uh, when you talk about the image of God, if it, sin had not entered the world, then there would have been no wars. That we would Agreed. be absolutely perfect. But since sin did enter the world, that image was marred. It wasn't destroyed. It was corrupted by sin. And it's only Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross that raises that image again to what it once was, but we are still in the process of becoming yet not having arrived. We still can sin. We're not sinners who try to be a saint. We're saints who have who sin on occasion because of our predisposition, bias, and habits, and the habits that were built up prior to us coming to the cross because we couldn't do anything but sinning prior to the cross. Well, and if you think about logically, if all war is sin, then we have a problem with our Lord in the Old Testament, because (laughs) there are a lot of wars that Israel that he led people in battle against the Philistines, the, you know, all the other people out there. You go to World War II. Yeah, I, I wasn't even born, but that period, and I've heard about it a lot. What do we do with someone who's killing six million Jews? And by the way, it was 3 million Christians that were killed, too. Most people realize that. Hmm. A lot of Christians were taken to the concentration camp. But what do we do? Well, Malachi says, you know, we're supposed to stand up for justice, you know, speak the truth. How do you do that if it is not just simply saying, well, I'm going to go to my room and pray and hope everything passes over me? Part of it is you have to be involved in the process. And if the Lord calls you to that, do that. The the command in the Ten Commandments is not... Thou shalt not kill. Thou so shalt not murder. It, right. It's correct. It says, Thou shalt not murder. It, thou, you should not unjustly take a life. But that doesn't mean that all killing is unjust. What I train men to understand all the time is that they're created for three purposes a cause to die for, a challenge to embrace, and loved ones to protect. So 
I find that God wires men in a certain way to be naturally protective. I saw a great meme. Uh, it, I would call it a meme. I don't know. A, a meme or whatever they, how do they pronounce it. Yeah. It was an Israel Israeli soldier <clears throat> who had passed away. And he had mm. just done an interview, and he was killed just this week in in, in southern Lebanon, uh, along with eight other IDF soldiers that were uh, that were killed in, in the previous few days. But just a couple weeks ago, he had done an interview, and he said this. He said, we do not fight because we hate that which is in front of us. We fight because we love what is behind us. Good word. Oh, that's a powerful Good word. statement. Wow. Yep. Wow. A question just came in. Uh, Erica was wondering the difference between killing and murder. What is the difference? Is there a difference? Yeah, so uh, killing is the, uh, I'm sorry, killing is any taking of a life. Murder is the unjust taking of life. Yes. I have literally had people ask me, well, you're a Christian pastor. How can you justify hunting? (laughs) Well, it's very obvious. The New Testament affirms that animals are to be eaten. We've turned them into not just pets today, but they are virtually our closest relatives, and they're more important than almost anybody else on the face of the earth. And so, therefore, people have more empathy toward animals than they do toward people. But the Bible says, you know, three times he told Peter, with the sheet being lowered down, rise up, kill, and eat. Animals are wonderful. I have had dogs all my life. But if my family was starving, believe me, the dog would have become our meal. Not that I don't (laughs) love the dog. But like you're saying, I have a responsibility to my family. If yeah. someone's attacking my house and threatening the lives of my loved ones uh, and I take them out in defense, that is a just killing. That's not murder. That's called self-defense. Our law recognizes this. And, and unfortunately, these laws are getting fuzzy because of uh, po- political pressures on one side or another. Uh, but yeah, there is there is just killing, then there is unjust killing. The command is, "Thou shall not murder." I just saw a real downward spike uh, after Tom Parrish made that comment. <laughs> <laughs> About dogs. Oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I could see the visible spike downward. Uh, but I think I understand your point, Tom. Um, next question is: How can we be more uh, confrontative after praying? To those who claim to follow Jesus, but do not show that in their actions. Well, in any case, any correction should be done with gentleness and reverence. That somehow you have to demonstrate that you have a genuine concern for the well-being and welfare of another individual, even if they're doing something that you vehemently oppose or that is sinful in nature. It doesn't mean that you hide from it. It may mean that you risk your friendship by telling them, here's what the scripture has to say about that. You know, of of late, I've always talked to people and saying, get the word you out of your vocabulary when you talk about somebody else's sin. Say, this is how I experience it. This is what the Bible says. And let them draw their own conclusion. Sometimes it means you have to, like Tom, you've shared a number of times where the questions you ask are convicting in and of themselves and holding them accountable for the sin in their life. Sometimes you just simply need to tell them, that's not what the Word of God has to say. If you you call yourself a member of God's family, He requires us to be living in this fashion. And so all I'm sharing with you, brother, is, is that go to the Word of God, and it'll bring clarity on your actions. Yeah. All right. Go, Jeff, comment. Well, I, was, I, I totally agree. Second uh, Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, as good Christians, we should use the Word of God in all of those areas, mm-hmm. teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. We can carry off a conversation with the right words, but at the tone of our voice, the the body posture can suggest to the person that we're hoping is going to be corrected by our, our, you know, talking to them about it, that we're not just asking them to to change their life, we're condemning them for the life that they're living. We're the judge, jury, and executioner when it's the Holy Spirit's job, yeah. according to John 14, 
or John 16, 8, that says he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's not our job. We're the purveyors of truth. We have a responsibility to somebody. We cannot retake responsibility for somebody. All right, Guy Talks taking a road trip next week. We are in the beautiful uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We will be there next Thursday if you want to show up and say hi and witness the program live and in person. You can text the word BILL to 877-933-2484. That will provide a link that you can click on with all the details. It's going to be at First Baptist Church in Sioux Falls. We're going to take a little break and be back, but text your questions over 877-933-2484, and we will be right back. Hi, podcast listener. You know, I'm Bill Arnold, and my theme song says, What's for Dinner?, And like when I'm grilling, I'm paying really close attention. And I know that ideal second to get the food off the grill. Like all good and ideal timings in life, right now would be an ideal time to be a cheerful giver to Faith Radio. Give now to support this podcast so that more people in more places might come to saving faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship and become a fully devoted follower. Click the link in the show notes or give now at myfaithradio.com. Dot com. Welcome back to the show. It is Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk, and they do it well. Greg B., Tom P., Jeff V., that's the lineup. Uh, they go from left to right, just for your uh, on your radio dial, from left to right. <laughs> and we have got great questions coming in. Here's a question. Do we fear Jesus will say to us, Away from me, I never knew you. Yikes. Is that ever going to happen? I love this Those one. Christians? Uh, this is from Matthew 7. So actually in the first hour, we were at the, the wide and narrow gate. And right after that comes this passage where it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell you plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. And so I don't know about you guys, but over the years of teaching classes for me, this question has come up often. There is a fear in many Christians that I'm not doing enough in some way. And will I ever hear those words from Jesus, depart from me? I never knew you. And the answer is no, Christian. You will never hear those words. This whole passage is about, starting in verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep clothing. They are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize this. Thus, by their fruit, you recognize them. That's who Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. False prophets. So unless you're a false prophet... You're never going to hear those words. You know, it's a variation of the theme that of works. In other words, if you're saying, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we perform this in your name? So they're trying to garner some degree of acceptance or embrace because of what they do. But the gospel is not about what you do. It's about you receiving what God's already done. And so anything you add to that is an anathema. You're suggesting that what he accomplished on the cross wasn't all we needed. We have to supplement it with something else. So here, I'm showing you, Lord, all the things I've done for you, and 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 shouldn't that count for something? And the, and the, the truth is, is that no, because it was already paid. It's interesting. I've heard this <clears throat> over and over through the re- years. And I, somewhere along the way, I began to ask what probably seemed like some strange questions. But I would ask people, when does this happen that you have these doubts? And they came back and they said, well, usually when I'm in bed, going to sleep, or when I'm alone and I'm isolated. I said, okay, I, I can see where the problem would come in. You're just thinking internally and these questions come up. Why don't you put on Christian music and sing along, <laughs> even when you're going to bed? We can all do that today. Put on some good Christian songs and sing along with them as you're going to sleep or as you're sitting there alone because the devil doesn't like that, and he's the one that's always accusing you. Ha, you think he loves you? I don't think so. And this is the way to defeat that. 
Tom, my terrible singing would keep me awake. <laughs> I'm trying to get to sleep, Tom. That's bad advice. That's why the Lord loves a joyful noise, Bill. <laughs> there is something. I, I We've actually talked about this before. Having on Christian music in your house, I don't know. The 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 Satan, the demonic world, or sometimes they don't want to nope. be around any of that. I've heard many stories where it's like somebody felt some kind of oppression and somebody said, put on Christian music in your home yep. and just let it play throughout the day. And they said that oppression went away. Yeah. You that's know, that's weird. I, don't, I can't explain this, yeah. but... Sometimes people can come into your in a person's home and they sense God's presence mm. because of the faith of your family, because of the commitments that you made, and they just feel different walking into your house. Um, and I, a lot of this, I think, has to do with my wife's faith and how strong it is. But I had several young men came by to see me late one night, and we were sitting outside in the campfire, and without any prompt, each of them said, there's a reason that we keep coming over here. We feel safe here. We mm. feel something's different here. We just feel secure here. And I said to them, what you're feeling, I believe, is Christ is present here. Yes. Yeah, amen. Nicely done. All right. Uh, I've always thought biblical hope is built on faith. Agree? You really can't have biblical hope apart from faith. Agreed. Okay. Yet there's a lot of people that have hope but it's not based on faith. Yet they have hope because they say, all I know when I leave this earth and go to the, see the big guy in the sky, I'll finally get to play around a round of golf on the big course. Yeah. And that's their hope. And we're stuck in this situation where we want to be kind and loving and truthful and honest and tell them what the truth says. Well, I think that kind of hope is a wish. Yes. The kind of hope that scripture talks about is not a wish it's just what you haven't seen yet and what you trust in that will happen so it's different than the hope that you described which is a wish it's not the hope a biblical hope in my view yeah and the confidence of faith is always in jesus and what he's done it's not in how strong we believe in it or how much we want it to happen or how much we hope it happens and so the Bible talks about faith, and then we have this assurance of hope that's ours because Jesus has declared this to be the truth, and we're trusting in him for everything, and so we can trust his word. So there's a big difference between what you're talking about, Bill, or what people are saying and what the Bible's saying. You know, the the Greek word for hope in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, is elpizo, and it is to wait for something with expectation. In other words, the the biblical, the Greek definition of hope is not like the English definition right. of hope, where our hope in English is, I it's it's a I hope something positive happens, it's but I'm wish. not sure yeah. of whether it will or not. It's like a wish. It's like a wish. Biblical hope is not that. Mm-hmm. So when it says in uh, in Hebrews, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of things unseen. Biblical hope is to wait for something you know is going to happen with expectation. Isn't that cool? I love that Greek yeah. definition of the word hope and that biblical hope is different than worldly. We need a new name. We need a different English word to translate this Greek word elpizo other than hope. We need something else like our expectation our future expectation or something, and that's or how our, that word should be translated. yet to be realized Correct, something like that. Yeah. When I entered seminary many years ago, my wife gave me a gift that I will always thank her for. Haven't seen it since. It's an eight-translation New Testament. So it's the entire New Testament, and every page, you had eight different translations of the same text. And it was a big, thick Bible, too, by the way. <laughs> what was fun about it is that when I would study or prepare, I would read... What the one, you know, the one version said about it, what the King James said, how they translated it, and it was the amalgamation of those eight that made such a difference in my way of thinking. And then I was privileged to learn the Greek, and that helped immensely. Mm-hmm. It's sad he couldn't learn it in one. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he needed know. eight. No, That's kind of sad. Boy, you, he really is on <laughs> you today, Tom. Kind of sad. I, you know, I, <laughs> but it, I understand. What's really cool is those tools now are available on many, many yeah. apps, like blueletterbible.org on your internet or on the app. Or you version. Yes, you version. You can click, yeah, version, click yeah. on a verse and see... <laughs> 
20 different versions on how it was translated. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I believe in Exodus, where it says that God was going to kill Moses. Can you offer any clarity or insight on such an intriguing question? Part of Scripture considering Moses' remarkable relationship with God. Oh, this is Exodus 4. Which verse is it? Uh, 20, 24. See, we need that music playing oh, yeah, in the background as we... Uh, yeah, the place Jeopardy on the music? Way, the Lord yeah, met him yeah, and sought to put him to death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what it says. So can you offer clarity on this passage? Any clarity or insight on such an intriguing question? God was going to kill Moses. And I think we've stumped Guy Talk. <laughs> Well, we had this question once before, too, because it doesn't really say anywhere leading up to this verse, you know, why God would be that upset with Moses. That's true. Why why was God so upset with Moses? We've had this before? We had it one other time, and I'm pretty sure you all gave us the same exact reaction you're giving us now, (laughs) which is silence. (laughs) Totally stumped, yeah. Well, one commentator doesn't really get to it, but gives some um, input that helps clarify a little bit. He says... The events narrated in these verses are significant not only for what they tell, but also for what they show. Not only has the Lord remembered his covenant promises, but his people are also called to remember the conditions of the covenant. Moses is held responsible for the provisions of the covenant with Abraham that required him to circumcise his sons. Failure to be circumcised may lead to being cut off some form of severe punishment from God, Moses' failure to circumcise his son could have led to his death had it not been for his wife's action. Once again, Moses' life is preserved through the actions of another, this time through his wife. Mm, That's what interesting. <clears throat> good, good. I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I just read it right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Let me take a little break. We'll come back. We'll field your question. Get it ready, set, and go. Text it over, 877 933 2484, it's Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. We'd love to get your question, and I bet we can do our best to answer it. Uh, Maybe better than the last question. Uh, We'll find out. 877-933-2484. I'll be right back. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? Yeah. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. It is the afternoon show, and it's Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. I have a professor, a pastor, and a Sunday school teacher on the team. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. We are here, ready, and willing to take your questions. Text them over 877 933 2484. You know that. I'm a minister, too. Okay. I, I, I married someone, so I got my ministry uh, certificate on the internet. So okay. I'm, I'm not just a Sunday school teacher. But I'm, are you an ordained minister? Well, I'm ordained according to the World Wide Web. I'm, I'm <laughs> See, but the problem is all you needed to get that was exact change. Well, yeah, it was twenty nine ninety nine. Two tops for material. But I have right. a certificate. Yeah. I have so, one as well. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, I it's I had to marry someone, so but I well, like you know I, I find it interesting that to perform a wedding in Minnesota, you have to be validated by the state of Minnesota and put into the record. And and what do you have to do to show that your ordination documents? Correct. Right. Yeah. And so that's what I have. But I actually like the Sunday school teacher uh, moniker for Title. me. Okay, that, good. I like that. Good. Are you offended, Jeff? No, I, I don't know why I brought this up, to be honest. This has been an interesting day, has <laughs> Yes, it has. All right, gentlemen, how finely should we tread between the realms of Christians and the world? For example, Daniel served under a non-believer, while Scripture says we should surround ourselves with believers. I like that question. I do, too. It's a good question. I think it comes down to this. We have to, as believers, go where the Lord leads us. Sometimes that's in very difficult circumstances. 
Other times it's in very nice circumstances. But I think the text is also telling us, beware of who you make your close allies that have nothing to do with the gospel or nothing to do with Jesus, because they can corrupt you along the way. So it's finding that balance. It's not that I don't, I love the unbelievers. I want them to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to go where they're at to share the gospel. But I'm not going to make going where they're at and doing what they're doing my lifestyle either. And I think that's the danger a lot of people run into. We're all called as followers of Christ to be ministers of reconciliation. But our citizenship is not here any longer. At the moment we receive Christ as Savior and Lord, it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean we live in a holy huddle or in a a Christian ghetto, and and, um, how are we going to reach people for Christ? We're to be in the world, to minister to the world for the sake of the world, but not be of the world. We will be considered sojourners, aliens, and foreigners in a foreign land, except we're not considered that way in this kingdom of God. But we acknowledge that we will be seen that way, but we're to call, we're, as I said, we're to go into the world, to minister to the world for the sake of the world, but not be of the world. I, I love the idea that we're in the world, but not of the world, right? <clears throat> and I think that ambassador description is such a powerful description yeah. because an ambassador is belongs to the kingdom from which they came, not to the kingdom in which they're serving, right? So they are their kingdom is from another place. And uh, I, there's so many aspects of the Christian life that that follow the description of an ambassador. There's one other description that that God uses, and that is of a soldier. He yeah. describes this as a soldier. And I want to read 2 Timothy 2.4. He says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. If we are soldiers for Christ and he is our commanding officer, it's like we go out into the world as soldiers to fight this battle for truth, right? And mm-hmm. uh, But we don't concern ourselves in the things of this world. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I love the picture of church as a safe place where we all come back, our armor gets dented and our sword needs sharpening and and our helmet needs straightening. We all come back together and we polish up all of our armor and then we go back out into the world again and fight the fight of truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. My next question is, what is the one right biblical thing that Christians talk about the most and do the least? Evangelize. That's what I was going to say, too. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. Yep. Unfortunately, yeah, that's the truth. It's it's a shame that we um, talk a good game, but we're never in the game when it comes to that issue in many cases. Well, there was an interesting discussion we had in the green room before the show. Tom, you had an interesting moment uh, when you were running up to the, the drugstore to pick up something and you were on your electric bike. T- tell that story. That's a great story. I... I my family insisted I buy a, a three-wheel electric bike. So at my old age, I don't fall off anymore. That's called uh, a tricycle, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I, I started with a tricycle. I'm going to end with a tricycle. It's a great time. So I go down there mm-hmm. the other day in the middle of the afternoon. And as I pull in and set it up so I can go in, a gentleman gets out of a car. He was backing out. He pulled it back in. And he said, hey, I really like your bike. Can I sit on it? I said, well, sure. Went and sat on it. We had about a 10 minute discussion. He kind of gave me a little background. And then all of a sudden, he started talking about that he had uh, a disease. And he really would like to have prayer for that disease. And I said, Well, I'm a pastor. I can pray for you. So we took time. We prayed right there in the parking lot. It was wonderful to do that. And he was very thankful. I go in. I come out about five minutes later with the things I used to pick up. He's waiting for me. Mm. He's waiting. And he said, I need the name of your church again, and I need the location, the time of your service, because I'm going to be there Sunday. And I hope I get to see him, but it was a unique opportunity, and I call that a divine appointment. I didn't try to set it up. It just happened. But didn't he also say to you that I was waiting for a pastor or something like yes, that? Yes, he, yeah, when we were talking, he said, I, I've been, in my prayer, I've been wanting somebody that would pray with me. Yes. And that I could get them to do that, but nobody knows how to do that. And I said, wow, wow well, I can do that. You know, and so when we laid on hands and prayed. That's wonderful. Good point, Greg. What a divine appointment. Yeah. All right. What kind of process was there for being a pastor or a preacher 
and being ordained during Bible times. And why is it so extensive now? I think it was extensive back then, wasn't it? Uh, no World Wide Web. That's true. Uh, to get a certificate <laughs> from. Uh, the church was very unorganized. There were no denominational systems. There was no seminaries. There are house churches. And just as we read earlier from Timothy, when Paul laid hands, I'm sorry, yeah, when Paul laid hands on Timothy and that there was this prophecy about him that he was going to do great ministry work, I have a feeling that most of the leadership uh, came about uh, in the similar way. Um, There was no formal uh, degrees. There was no quote-unquote uh, seminary, you know, doctorates in seminary of this or that or whatever. So, and and I would argue, by the way, remember this, Christian, you have the same Holy Spirit and the same Word of God that every single teacher of the Bible, regardless of their degrees or titles or anything else has, you have the exact same thing. And by the way, God wants you to study His Word. He wants you to be that good Berean uh, to 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 search the Word of God to see if what Paul said was true, so he commends the Bereans. But be that good Berean. You have the same Word, the same Holy Spirit. But didn't Paul also go to Jerusalem and declare to them that he too was an apostle yes. called to ministry? And they validated him and set him apart to minister to the Greeks, where they said Peter was set apart to minister to the Jews. Mm-hmm. So there was some kind of formality that was... Was, was there in that process, I don't know if you could declare that that was a legitimizing a, a whole process that followed after that, but we do have that incident. Well, I don't know anywhere in the New Testament where the word ordination <clears throat> is yeah. used as we understand right. it. What it was was the laying out of hands by the elders or by the church leaders and declaring this person has been set apart by the Lord Jesus to proclaim the word or do this or that. That's technically what should be going on with the seminary type of thing after your three or four years of education. Unfortunately, we formalized it into an educational process. And I know people that have gone into ministry, and and I don't want to sound judgmental, but I'm going to speak out. They should have never gone in the first place. They they really weren't. They had the education. They didn't have the heart for people. They didn't have the heart for the Lord. And Unfortunately, they didn't last, or fortunately, they didn't last very long either in the ministry. But it is the setting apart. And we had talked earlier about people recognizing when you're young who you are, what gifts you have, and mm-hmm. beginning to talk to you then about being set apart for the Lord's work. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think you're, you guys are right. I mean, you made good points. It made me thinking that, you know, the first part of our answer, we made this maybe sound like it's a bad thing that all these institutions are there. But we got to remember that, you know, Paul was an apostle appointed yep. by God. He appointed elders into towns. If Paul lays hands on you, yeah. you know, you're probably going to be a leader in the church, right? Yeah. Today, we don't have Paul's running around. And so we have to have other institutions. So we have denominational systems and churches and some to guard, to put, you know, kind of guard posts up around the yeah. church and doctrine within the church so that only those who have been to a certain school or passed certain tests, uh, we give that authority to you. And you know what? Th- that's probably not a bad thing. You'd, you'd want yeah. it to be much yeah. more spiritual than that, but but it's not a bad thing. No, it's a balance between all of it. It's the education, which I think is important. It is the what they've already been doing experientially. Mm-hmm. It's how they've been ministering and the leadership of the church. And usually in the New that, Testament yeah. was the local church recognizing that person as being called by the Lord mm-hmm. and then laying hands on them. And they would do that publicly. They would do Good that in point. front of the whole body to declare this person is now set apart. I agree with you. What we do, what we're struggling with is just making an institution. And remember that God gave us very specific qualifications for our elders in every single church, in Timothy and in Mm -hmm. Titus. So uh, churches need to be responsible to make sure their elders meet the qualifications in Scripture. There are nine of them, and I just had outlined those not long ago, and I've been teaching it to my church. There are nine qualifications for an elder and nine specific things they're called to do. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty heavy list. It is. All right, it is Guy Talk, or Guys Who Talk. Let me know what questions you have. We still have time for your question, 877-933-2484. 
All right, gentlemen, in the Apostles' Creed, when it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, what is the meaning of Catholic Church? It means the universal followers of Christ. It's not meaning about the Roman Catholicism. It's talking about the term Catholic means um, the universal church, the church that's not, uh, that gathers together by people, not in uh, location. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, because uh, Catholicism uses the big C yeah. as a, a distinct group of people. But the but the creed uh, didn't know anything about Catholicism back in the 3rd century when this was written, or the 4th century. What they did is they used the word, as you said, Greg, Catholic to mean the universal, the universal. church. Wherever you're at, whether in Asia Minor, Jerusalem, it didn't matter, this is the church. Mm-hmm. All right, Tim, you want to try to redeem yourself? Take <laughs> us to break? <laughs> Why not? Take us to break then. We're ready to go to break already? Yes, we are. Oh, listen, you've been listening to Guy Talk with Bill Arnold, and he usually has a lot to say, and we're glad you tuned in to hear it. And if you have a text message you want to send it in, don't be afraid to give us a call at 877-933-2484. We'll be right back after the break. (laughs) It is my deepest desire that you take the very first step of faith by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you've got questions about what it means to begin a relationship with Jesus— Text the word FAITH to 41224. Welcome to the show. If you just climbed in your car, I hope you had a good day. Next Thursday, one week from today, Guy Talk is going to be live in Sioux Falls. And if you are in that area, love to see you. I'm thinking of my friend Jim. I think he's in that neighborhood. I expect to see you, Jim. And all kinds of other uh, friends. It's going to be... uh, At First Baptist in Sioux Falls, you can text the word Bill to 877-933-2484, and we'll send you a link with all the information. Pretty easy. Just text the word Bill, 877-933-2484. We need someone to text in a really good pizza place before we go on air. We can go get some pizza, maybe, guys, and stop at a pizza place near the church. Goodness knows we don't get it around here. We might as well do it there, huh? Jeff does all the good thinking (laughs) in this room. How about that? Isn't that a great idea? It's a great idea. I'll even go and pick up the pizzas for us, but we need a good pizza place. All right. Here is my next question. With everything going on in the Middle East, where or who is Lebanon in the prophecy of Daniel? And also, is it true that all the prophecies have been fulfilled before Jesus returns except for one? Oh, say, say that second part again. Is it true that all the prophecies have been fulfilled before Jesus returns except for one? I don't know if I completely understand that last part of that question. Except uh, the only for... thing left to happen is the tribulation or is the, um, um, the rapture. rapture. Yeah. Yeah. So if if they mean by his return, well, I, don't, I guess I don't know. Let's talk about the first part. I don't think Lebanon does not show up in the Daniel 9 prophecy, although the, there are prophecies for Lebanon uh, in Scripture, like many of the other nations of the world that were are existent at that time. Uh, most of them have to do with destruction, by the way, which most of them relate to the final destruction of the nations that occurs when Jesus returns and destroys all of the earthly kingdom and establishes his kingdom. Uh, so that's where most of the prophecies in Scripture refer to. But um, it, it, let me try to adjust what I think the Scripture is saying. Look, when Jesus returns to earth, I'm not going to talk about the rapture, but when he comes to earth at the second coming— and his feet, as Zechariah says, stand on the Mount of Olives, and he begins to rule and reign for a thousand years from sea to sea, from Jerusalem, from a rebuilt temple, uh, there are still prophecies to be fulfilled. Actually, several prophecies to be fulfilled. And that is prophecies relating to the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, We just read it, that Satan is loosed towards the end of the Millennial Kingdom. Then there's the final judgment, the great white throne, and then there's the new heaven and new earth and New Jerusalem that comes down to heaven in our eternal state. So there's still several things that need to happen after Jesus returns that are prophesied in Scripture. Yeah, Scripture includes Lebanon as being within the promised land. Moses and, and Joshua both mention Lebanon when talking about the promised land and its boundaries. And so it it it's, it's, uh, doesn't have a letter corresponding to it, but the name occurs nearly 70 times in the Hebrew Bible, and they give the Hebrew 
word mm-hmm. for it. It's it, and it's um, translated as Lebanon. So, what? yeah, the, it's an interesting discussion. What were the borders of mm-hmm. the promised land that God gave to Israel? Much larger than they are now. Much larger yeah. than the land of Israel now. We actually have three of the borders are actually described in Scripture. On the north, it's the river Euphrates, which is way north of where the current northern border mm-hmm. of Israel is. To the west is the Mediterranean Sea, obviously, which is uh, kind of undisputed. On the south side, it's called, the southern border is described as the River of Egypt. Um, that's debated whether that means the Nile or whether it means another river that was in the Sinai, an eddy they're called the River of Egypt. And then the eastern border is a little nebulous. A lot of different theologians have a lot of different ideas. But regardless, like you said, Lebanon proper is within the land that God declared as the promised land of yes. Israel. And But I don't think they'll ever occupy all that land until the millennial reign That's when correct. Christ returns. That's correct. So what's keeping you guys up at night? Or are you all sleeping well? Hmm. I, I think for me, all of the carnage that's happening around us. And what I mean, keeping me up at night, it just makes me alert and it makes me more aware of Christ's imminent return. And when we see the proliferation of evil, not only happening in our own culture, but the wars and rumors of wars that Scripture so often describes, that that's happening everywhere, the dearth of statesmen and and being replaced by politicians, and in many cases, corrupt politicians, the rise of dictatorships around the world. Um, And uh, just that that does indeed concern me and, and does keep me up to a degree. What it also does is stimulate me to do what God's called me to do and not pull away from it, and that is to minister to men, yep. to help them become fully devoted followers of Christ, that mm. whatever light they have is all the brighter against a growing darkness. Mm. He pretty much covered what I'm saying I'm going to make for, so that's pretty good. Thank you, Greg, and I mean it. Those are my same concerns. It is My concern is for, I look at my children, my grandchildren, and I'm going to be leaving this world before long, yeah. They're still going to be in a pretty corrupt world with corrupt governments and yes. corrupt behavior. But at the same time, my biggest concern is getting people to hear the gospel, bringing people to faith in Jesus. And the more we can do of that, the better off we're going to be. Uh, spicy chili keeps me up at night. <laughs> really? It hits me. Just, no, I, I think I've, I thought the only thing is is your loved ones knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. I mean, you can't take anything with you into eternity except those you love. Yeah. You can preach Christ to them. So I, pre- all my children are believers. All their spouses are believers. Uh, I have now grandchildren. They're t- still young, but to pray for the salvation of all the members of my family. Lovely. I'm in the same place, and I know you are too, mm, Greg. Yeah, absolutely. White and I did that yesterday. We prayed for people who have loved ones that are outside of God's family Mm -hmm. and that we said sent over names and we had a wonderful time of prayer and we're just trusting that those names that were spoken yesterday, that the Holy Spirit is now at work in their lives once again and praying that the Holy Spirit will open their heart so they can receive the gift of salvation. You know, God has been described oftentimes as the hound of heaven. He will never give up on you. And he'll right to the very end. If you have loved ones that have not come to Christ yet, God is not asleep, not waiting for your prayer. He's actively seeking after those that no one comes to Christ except through the Father. So know that. Continue to pray for them, and but know God is pressing them to a decision or to a point where they'll seriously consider the gospel. Yes. All right. One week from today, we're going to be in Sioux Falls, and if you are in that area, we would love for you to show up and participate in Guide Talk Live. It's going to be a wonderful afternoon, and it's going to be at First Baptist Church of Sioux Falls. I hope I said that right. But all you have to do to get more information and find a seat for yourself at the event is to text the word BILL to 877-933-2484. Eight four, and you'll get a link for information. Just got a note that 
Tomicelli's Pizza in Sioux Falls is the place to go. Tomicelli's. Tomicelli's. Yeah. I remember right that name because it's a unique one. <laughs> yeah, that will be easy to remember. Yes. Thank you, and I appreciate you guys very much. I will see you next week in South Dakota. How about that? Sounds yeah. like fun. Have a, have a great night, everyone. We'll we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.